welcome dear participants to the fifth module of the first week in the previous module we had introduced oculasics or the language of the eyes we had looked at different types of gazes in this module we would look at the role of eye contact in different interpersonal situations for example in the classroom as well as during other certain professional situations like making a presentation and facing interviews etc during any interaction it is important to hold the eyes of the other person you are talking to in fact eye contact is an integral part of human interaction in a way it has been found that it is hardwired in our system if we are able to retain the gaze of a person during our interaction we find that it results in the better retention of the content at the same time we are able to explain our ideas in a better way and get an immediate feedback also if we are able to automatically shift attention in the direction of another person's gaze it also results in both people looking at the same thing and attending to the same thing we will see how during one to one dialogue as well as in small group presentations this skill is helpful this phenomenon of joint attention facilitates development of language as well as social cognition particularly in young children in the previous module we had referred to neuro linguistic programming theorists who are working in the area of nlp suggest that the natural eye movements that accompany thought processes are never random rather these eye movements are correlated with the content we are thinking of as well as the larger pattern of these thoughts the level of eye contact as well as in some situations an absolute lack of eye contact reflects the person's psychiatric or neurological functioning in various medical journals this aspect has been commented on and later findings have corroborated them in professional situations also medical researchers have found that amongst people who are depressed or anxious or psychotic there is a difficulty in maintaining a good and frequent eye contact similarly people who have attention deficit disorder or hyperactivity are frequently observed to rapidly scan the environment in a single gaze in therapeutic relationships a good eye contact is associated with a better and more successful recognition of psychological distresses in patients we can also say that these tendencies are reflected in our classroom also when we are engaging a class as well as in other professional interpersonal settings these findings are equally valid in the classroom situations all of us know on the basis of our experience that as teachers we might be looking at anywhere in the classroom at any time but students tend to learn more from those teachers who they think are trying to maintain an eye contact with them and they automatically are rather bored with those people who are referring to their notes continuously or simply writing on the blackboard without maintaining an eye contact manusov and peterson have reflected on the potentially important eye behavior for teachers which they have termed as the teacher stare and we often use it to manage the students classroom behavior at the same time we find that we can avoid unnecessary hostile attribution with unruly pupils by considering proximity as well as brief eye contact with them however at the same time it is important that we avoid unnecessarily extended eye contact with a particular person as too long a stare may generate a perception of hostility or threat or at the same time may make the person unnecessarily defensive eye contact is equally important during the panel discussions also in panel discussions as well as in other public discussions we find that the physical arrangement of seating is very meticulously designed 
It should be designed in such a way that all the speakers are able to look at each other, maintain a positive eye contact with every other participant in the panel as well as they have an unobstructed eye contact with the audience also. Here in the given picture, we can feel that panelists are seated in a semicircle in front of the audience and then at the same time there are proper paper name tents in front of each speaker and the lighting is also adequately bright. In comparison to these seating arrangements where a positive eye contact is encouraged, we can also look at certain other images where the eye contact is not fully possible. In this image, we find that the decker or the mission saw is very nicely done. There is a nice stage setting, there are comfortable chairs, there are low uh, tables so that the view with the audience is not obstructed. But the chairs have been put in a straight line so that the speakers are unable to have any eye contact with each other while they are participating. The level of participation as well as the enthusiasm of the speakers would automatically be adversely affected in this situation. These two different seating arrangements automatically convey the significance of eye contact in these type of situations. Eye contact is equally important in all the interview situations. In fact, it can be said that a direct and positive eye contact can often make the difference between one's selection or rejection. Eyes indicate the level of our interest. They also indicate the level of our confidence as well as the level of professional preparation during our interaction. A positive eye contact suggests interest as well as preparedness on the part of the candidate as well as it also suggests that the person is careful of the employer's time and energy and is fully prepared to appreciate it and this is reflected not only with the help of the answers but also with the help of eyes. Eye level conveys confidence. So, if a candidate during an interview looks down at the shoes or focuses on the table, then these type of gaze directions convey a lack of confidence, less prepared candidate as well as a nervousness on his or her part. At the same time, making eye contact in a positive and confident manner sends the message that the candidate is fully prepared. During the interviews, sometimes candidates become confused as to with whom they have to maintain the eye contact. If they are being interviewed by a group of people, then should they only focus on the person who has asked the question or should they look at the complete team? I would suggest that one should focus automatically more on the person who has asked the question, but while they are answering, they should also maintain an equal eye contact with the rest of the team members also. A positive eye contact during interviews exhibits honesty as well as interest and intentions of the candidate. While it is good and advisable to make a positive eye contact, one should also be careful not to introduce a sudden change in one's eye contact. For example, you have been facing the interview board with a positive eye contact. But suddenly in answer to a particular question, you will start blinking or you start avoiding the gaze. Then it would send negative messages immediately. If not about the whole candidature, then definitely about that particular point where you had started blinking or avoiding the gaze. Some people have a particular sparkle in their eyes. The eyes shine and Often we find that this shine or a sparkle is associated with the level of preparedness. If a candidate is fully prepared and is confident that the answer he or she is providing is correct, then automatically there would be a shine and confidence in the eyes. This shine and sparkle allows the interviewer to think 
that what you are talking about is actually an aspect in which you are interested and at the same time you are revealing an information of which you are proud. It is important that when you are giving information about your achievements, about your past experience or your academic excellence, then it has to be given with a certain level of confidence and a sparkle in the eyes. This sparkle inspires the employer who may think that here is a candidate who is definitely interested in the position. Eye contact is often linked with the trust issue because as a society we have been taught right from the childhood that someone who looks away during the conversation while answering a question is not a person whom we can trust easily and therefore in the context which we have already decided for this dialogue of body language during this course, eye contact is definitely linked with the trust issue. It is also linked with good manners and likability. In some countries, for example in Japan, in traditional setups, people are still encouraged to avoid a direct eye contact which may sometimes be understood as being rude. In comparison to that, in the USA, we find that a directness of the gaze is always preferred. While it is good to be aware of the cultural differences which exist and one should be sensitive to them, it is also important that a directness of the gaze is something which is more and more being considered as an exhibit of one's level of confidence and openness. During our conversation, it is important that we maintain continuously a direct eye contact. Sometimes it may be possible that in order to think about something or in order to organize our ideas, we look away as an exhibition of an inward thought for a couple of seconds and this is perfectly alright. So, this is a part of the direct eye contact and it should not be thought that even while you are looking away for a couple of seconds in order to reorganize your ideas, it is something negative. During a presentation as well as during a one to one conversation, it is important to captivate the eyes of the person with whom you are talking. In order to control the gaze of a person you are interacting with, sometimes a pen or a pointer may be used during the presentation. While you are talking to a person and you find that the other person is looking at, at some other places which indicates that he or she might not be very interested in what you are saying or is busy in one's own thoughts, then it sometimes works as a good strategy. You can use a pen or a pointer and gradually bring this in front of the eyes of that person. Gradually you would find that the eyes of that person are focused on this pen and gradually this pen can be brought to the point which you want to illustrate. So, you would find that gradually by captivating the eyes of the other person, you would be in a position to make the other person look at the point you want to highlight. This is important not only during these type of presentations where you are displaying something on some type of a board or a screen, but it is equally important when you are displaying something on a piece of paper to someone. The same strategy works during these type of dialogues also. This particular image which I have taken from Ellen Pease illustrates it very significantly. As you can see in the first image, the speaker is trying to ensure that the gaze is shifted towards the tip of the pen and then in the second image, the person has gradually brought the pen to the point in the book or the notebook where the person has to concentrate. So, controlling eyes during the dialogue also controls the thought patterns of the other person. During other public speech situations as well as during any social interaction, where one is in a formal position presenting something, maintaining an eye contact is very important. Often we have to make presentations during conferences and we may be asked several questions. While answering these questions, it is important to have a positive eye contact to build trust 
and engage the attention of the audience. In these situations, it is advisable to engage the whole body, open the whole body towards the audience. Turn in such a manner towards the audience that the person feels that you are actually turning to look at the person, listen to the question which is being asked and then answering to that. These suggestions help the person to think that you are genuinely interested in the question which has been asked. In the particular video, you would find that these aspects of opening up one's body as well as maintaining the eye contact is done very nicely. Bill Clinton, he's world renowned for making people feel like even when he speaks to them down the line as he shakes their hand, he makes them feel like they're the only person in the room, like they're the person that he cares most about. And people always question what it is that creates this effect. My hypothesis, my thesis, if you will, is that it's his eye contact. I've been governor of a small state for 12 years. I'll tell you how it's affected me. Every year, Congress and the president sign laws that makes a, make us... A... So the first thing you'll notice, and throughout this, is that probably 90 to 95% of the time that Bill Clinton is speaking, he is looking directly at this woman. He holds eye contact with her. A lot of people struggle to do this. When they're listening, they have no problem looking someone in the eyes. But when it comes time to speak, they get very, very, very uncomfortable with it. They can't think straight. See, one of the things that Bill Clinton does very well is when he breaks eye contact, it's not an abrupt thing. In fact, as he walks away from this woman, he signifies with his body first that he's about to leave by shifting his weight, continues to speak for a few more seconds, and only then does he look away. So that way the eye contact is not immediately broken. There's a sense that he's about to wrap up what he says, and it's almost like saying goodbye so she knows that it's over. So just take a look. Most people are working harder for less money than they were making 10 years ago. It is because we are in the grip of a failed economic theory. And this decision you're about to make better be about what kind of economic theory you want. Not just people saying, I'm going to go fix it, but what are we going to do? What I think we have to do is invest in America. So he starts shifting his body right here. You can see he's about to walk away. American jobs, American education, control American health care costs, and bring the American people together again. We have been talking about the significance of good and positive eye contact. But a too much emphasis on eye contact during initial contact, etc., sometimes may create a level of discomfort in the communicator and one may feel rather apprehensive of this pressure of maintaining good and positive and open eye contact while making a presentation, while participating in a group discussion, interviews or brainstorming sessions, etc. And therefore, this pressure would somehow make us fidgety. And therefore, it has been noticed that there are people who are acutely aware of the fact that they have to maintain an eye contact and still they are unable to do it. It results in negative body postures also. So, what strategies we can adopt to avoid this tension? In order to avoid these situations, sometimes people try to pick up a random object for example, a paperweight which is lying on the table and then they keep on looking at it. In fact, they may end up talking to a paperweight instead of talking to the interviewer. However, if a negative eye contact is bad, too much of an eye contact is equally bad, if not worse. If somebody stares deeply into the interviewer's eyes, the entire interview may end up with minimal blinking and creating a very strange impression on the other person. In order to avoid these two situations of extreme, we should try to plan and prepare for a happy medium. I would like to mention a trick which I have found very effective. It was first mentioned by Dale Carnegie and the trick is very simple. That means that you have to look at the interviewer's eyes long enough to register the color of the interviewer's eyes. For whatever reason, this fraction of seconds of eye contact allows the person to think that you are not hesitant in making a positive eye contact. And often it helps those people who feel awkward in maintaining a proper eye contact. Maintaining an eye contact 
during presentations may be rather tricky, particularly if the size of the audience is pretty large. Obviously, we cannot look at everybody. Therefore, certain strategies can be used. A particular strategy is to look at the top of head, at the front row of people who are sitting uh, in the hall. For example, you can look at the first row, but instead of looking into their eyes, you can try to look at couple of inches higher than the head, for example, or the hairline. And then the people who are sitting on the back rows would automatically think that you are trying to look at them as well as the front row people also. Another trick is to think of the audience as sitting in a Z formation. With the help of the eyes, you try to gaze at the people making a Z. And different points of this Z would allow you to maintain a positive eye contact with different sections of the people. While making the Z with your eyes, it is also important to look closely at certain sections of the audience once and twice, varying the gaze depending on the suitability of the content. While we make a full eye contact, a positive eye contact, it is also important to learn that the whole face contact should also be accompanied with it. As we would see later on in our discussions of body language, the whole face contact which incorporates the smiles as well as nods depending on the content also incorporates a feeling of positivity among the audience, particularly during the interaction sessions. At the same time, if you are standing on a lectern, then you also have to peg a real or imaginary point or person in every corner of the group and then by maintaining different types of eye contacts, you would find that you can create this impression among the audience that you are looking at a larger number of them. And even if we are not able to maintain a direct eye contact with a large audience, it is absolutely essential to pass on this impression that we have this desire to maintain this eye contact and in fact we are maintaining this eye contact in the given situation. Inadequate eye contact results in very awkward situations. In fact, the significance of eye contact has been adapted in various TV shows to create certain hilarious moments. Some of you might be familiar with the famous American TV sitcom Friends, which was aired between 1994 and 2004 for 10 seasons on NBC television. This is a story which is based on six friends and in this particular clipping, you can look at some various hilarious moments when different friends try to incorporate eye contact, sometimes too much eye contact and sometimes very little eye contact. There are three primary theories <laughs> concerning sediment flow rate. <laughs> Each of these theories can be further subcategorized into... I don't know. I'm telling you. <laughs> I can do it. Yeah, you can do it. <laughs> hey, listen, guys, we feel really terrible. He's doing that weird eye contact thing. Don't look at him. Don't look at him. <laughs> Come on, you guys. We want you to know we're very, very sorry. Whereas in interactive situations, a positive eye contact is important. It is also helpful for us to understand what different type of glances and gazes mean to us. Let's look at the sideway glance and what are the different messages it may communicate. 
It may communicate a sense of hostility, uncertainty or suspicion and at the same time it can also give a suggestion of being interested in the other person. In order to understand what exactly is the emotion which is being conveyed, we have to look at accompanying kinesic behavior. If it is the emotion of hostility and suspicion which is being passed on, you would find that the head would turn away, the eyebrows would furrow, lines would appear on the forehead, mouth will droop and go critical. At the same time, if somebody is interested, then the neck may be exposed, the head may be tilted, the eyebrows may be raised, there may be a little smile and often you would find that this is understood as a courtship signal also. So, you would find that in order to understand the glance and its significance, it is imperative for us to look at the interpretations of the accompanying body signals also. As we have discussed earlier, a particular isolated non-verbal signal is like an isolated word which may have different meanings. It is only when we look at the cluster of kinesic movements that we are able to fix the meaning by putting it in a sentence. Similarly, you would find that extended blinking also occurs in an unconscious manner. It may occur when either a person is engrossed in one's own thought and wants to cut off from the whole situation or on the other hand wants to in a way block others from the sight and from the cognizance itself. The extended blinking suggests that the brain does not want to tolerate dealing with the other person who is talking or the person is not interested in the content at all finds it extremely painful. So, you would find that the eyes would shut automatically for 2 or 3 seconds or even longer and the sight remains closed as a person wants to remove you momentarily from his mind. We can understand that it is a negative gaze. Let us look at some other examples of darting eyes, stammering eyes or even the gaze avoidance. Darting eyes suggest the gaze in which a person enters the room and suddenly wants to check at what is happening in the room in a single gaze. Sometimes you would find that it may suggest authority. A person in authority has entered the room and wants to find out what everybody is doing. Or at the same time, in situations of extreme nervousness, when the brain is trying to look for a possible escape route. In these situations, if it is suggested and authenticated by the rest of the kinesic signals, then it reveals the insecurity of a person. Darting eyes are also associated with the lying behavior of people. However, researchers tell us that practiced liars have learned to hold the gaze for a longer period. So, holding the gaze for an unnecessarily longer period as well as darting eyes both may suggest that the person is lying. At the same time, stammering eyes suggest an action of keeping the eyes closed for prolonged periods of time. That means that we do not want to speak out what exactly is in our mind. An altogether gaze avoidance is normally associated with negative emotions. A person may be nervous, may be feeling downcast, wants to avoid the other person wants to show the anger etc or the superiority. However, you would find that sometimes gaze avoidance may also be associated with the intention of coming across as a more subordinate person or sometimes it may be an excuse to reduce the anxiety and intensity so as to diffuse the situation. So, we have looked at different types of eye contacts. Whereas, a positive eye contact is very important for us. A negative or shifty eye contact also passes on negative associations for us. However, I would reiterate this fact that in order to make out the true interpretation of the oculistic behavior, it is important to authenticate it by looking at other associated signals also. A very interesting video suggests 
how eyes are connected with other cues from body language and how they help us to reach a particular conclusion. Here I would also like to point out that there is a variation between the speed of speech and the speed of comprehension. Normally we have a capacity to listen somewhere around 650 to 700 words per minute and I am talking about an averagely educated person. However, the rate of speech is relatively slow. We normally cannot speak for more than 150 words per minute. If we speak more words than this, then the speech would become too fast and the audience would not be able to comprehend it properly. Therefore, we find that average listeners have three quarters of the listening time and they automatically use it to evaluate the content of what is being said, to focus on the kinesic signals, to look at the eyes, to accept, reject or contest what is being said. And often you would find that impatient students as well as impatient participants in any professional dialogue can often interrupt the speaker to ask the questions. And this is normally done to pick up the non-verbal accompaniments of speech. If the listener looks away from the speaker during the talk or presentation, it suggests that the listener does not necessarily agree with the content or has certain reservations about it. Looking at the speaker during the talk suggests interest and agreement also. If a speaker looks at the audience, it suggests confidence with the content as well as an openness to share the content with the audience. However, if the speaker looks away from the audience, it suggests that either the person does not have confidence in the content or wants to avoid further questioning or at the same time may try to hide certain feeling. In certain scenarios, particularly in professional situations, one's status is also important. People of higher status look relatively less while they have to listen to what other people say and they look at their subordinates more while they are talking to them or passing on certain instructions to them. So, clustering with other non-verbal signals is important as we have already seen in the previous video. We had referred to neuro-linguistic programming in our previous module. It was started by Dr. Richard Bandler and Dr. John Grinder, and we can say that it is like learning the language of our own mind. They have authenticated with the help of their research that the random movement of the eyes indicate the background processes which are running through the mind of the speaker and then this is reflected through the direction of gaze. In our previous module, we have discussed it in detail and if you look closely at this diagram, you would find that this is a further information about it. This diagram also reiterates the findings of NLP which are helpful for us. And we are told what may be the indications if the person is looking at a particular direction. You would find that the left and right directions are indicative of different types of thinking procedures. Though NLP as a science has been established relatively recently, we find that the first indications of NLP are found in William James Treatise, Principles of Psychology, which was published in 1890. Students of literature in general are familiar with this work because it is this work which for the first time had also mentioned the phrase stream of consciousness. William James had originally documented the association of eye movements with the thought processes and he had described in principles of psychology that merely thinking about a visual image caused a fluctuating play of pressures, convergences, divergences and accommodations in eyeballs. However, this idea had remained dormant till 1970s. The video which we would play right now encapsulates the basic findings of NLP as far as eye contact is concerned. We hold different pieces of information in different parts of our brain. 
And usually when we're thinking about a particular type of information, our eyes will go in one particular direction. Ask most people about a memory that they can visually recall in their brain, you know, maybe a childhood memory when they were playing in the park with friends. They'll look up and to the left as they recall that memory. But if you ask people about linear things like data, statistics, ask them to add up numbers, they'll quite often look up and to the right. People, when they're being emotional, upset, the feeling channel is down here and to the right. Whereas we quite often see people, when they're talking to themselves, they'll look down and to the left as they formulate an answer to something. There's also horizontal, which is your audio channel. If you are at home late at night, three o'clock in the morning, and you hear a noise outside, if it's the cats playing around with the bins or something that you know the sound of, you'll quite often look to the side, to the left, because this is your recall side. It's a sound you understand and you know. However, if it's a sound you don't understand and you don't know, you'll look to the right and try and work out what... So with this, we end our discussion of oculasics. However, later on when we will look at the clustering of different types of kinesic signals, we would be referring to some gazes once again. Thank you.